Uh, would you turn with me, please, to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, we're continuing in our series in the book of Exodus. Uh, we are going to look this morning, the focus is going to be on verses 13 to the end of the chapter, but I'll start reading at verse 9. Uh, so that we have some of the context here. Uh, Moses is having this conversation with God on Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai, at the bush that is, that is, not, that is burning but not consumed by the fire. Uh, and we pick up at verse 9, hear the word of our God. It says, And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will, say, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people of Israel out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent, me, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the, the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt, to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and your daughters so you shall plunder the Egyptians. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Now, Lord, true and living God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, <laughs> I am here to tell you this morning that our God certainly has a sense of humor, right? Uh, here I am uh, set to preach a sermon on the hope that we have in knowing the never-changing God in an ever-changing world, uh, and it just so happens that, that on this very day, the Lord sees fit to bring a change into my life that is going to change my world uh, from this time forth. Uh, and so, uh, a just amazing uh, stroke of providence this morning. Uh, God says to Moses, I am who I am. Uh, I am who I am. I, I want to tell, talk to you at, at the very start. I want to point your attention at the start here to the words of Jesus that are written in the bulletin in the, in the, ser in the uh, passage that you'll hear right after the sermon. Uh, you were supposed to hear it before the sermon, uh, but the Lord had other plans. In John chapter 8, where Jesus is having this, uh, this little dispute with the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Israel, about his relationship to Abraham, right? And, and they're talking about these things, and, and they ask Jesus, right, who are you making yourself out to be? And how does Jesus respond to that question? Uh, they, they say to him, are you greater than even our father Abraham? And Jesus says, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, what? Before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Unquestionably pointing us back to this encounter of Moses with the Lord at the burning bush when God says to Moses, I am that I am. I am, right? What is Jesus saying there? He's saying, I am the God of the Old Testament. He's saying, I am the one whom Abraham looked to. I am the one whom, whom Moses spoke with on the mountain. I am, generation after generation, I am. I am that God. You know, you may have heard it uh, said before that there's, there's a different God presented in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Have you heard people say this before? Uh, don't tell that to Jesus, right? Jesus is very clear. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the one to whom the entire Old Testament pointed and indeed about whom the, whole, the entire Old Testament was written. Uh, and so that's really the point that I want to make with you this morning. That's what I want to focus on this morning as we consider what is, what is contained in this name of God, I am that I am, right? Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is the unchanging one, and that, beloved, is the rock on which we can stand in a world and in lives that are always changing. Uh, when when we, we live in this world and we live these lives where things are, so many things are so uncertain, uh, what does the future hold? What is the point of what's going on in my life? What is the point of what's going on in the world right now? God says, I am that I am. I am the God who was and is and is to come. I am the God. I am the same yesterday and today and forever. I am a rock on which you can stand as you sojourn through the shifting sand of this life. Uh, and so that's what I want us to, to consider. So last week, Exodus 3, right? Last week we looked at the first 12 verses of this chapter and we saw how God appeared uh, to Moses in the fire out of the midst of this bush uh, on, on Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai, and told Moses how he had heard the cries of his people, how he had seen their sufferings, and how he had now come down to deliver them. And then he sent Moses out uh, to go back to Egypt, to go back uh, and, and relay this message to the people of Israel and to Pharaoh. And it can be easy for us as we're looking at this passage, especially as it's a, pr a particularly uh, um, familiar passage to us, right? It can be easy for us to just sort of breeze through and not remember the fact that this Moses guy was a real person. Uh, he lived a real life. He had a real story. And, and, and as a real person, I would imagine that this Moses sort of struggled with the same basic sorts of questions of life that we all struggled with. My, I, what is my identity? What is my purpose? Especially when you consider the history of this man. At this point, and, and, and with this encounter, he's now 80 years old or at least close to 80 years old, right? He's a guy who was brought up in the house of Pharaoh, uh, and, and in, in early adulthood, he, he chose to identify with his people, Israel, who were enslaved by the very Pharaoh in whose house he was brought up in. Right? So what is my identity here? Uh, what is my purpose? And now he's been living out in exile in this foreign land, in the land of Midian. He's, he's an older man at this point. He's settled down into this new life that the Lord has sort of thrown him into. He has a family, all these sorts of things. He's been working a regular job as a shepherd, keeping the sheep of his father-in-law Jethro. And all of a sudden, this one day, once again, everything drastically changes for this man as he has an encounter with God on this mountain. And God tells him that he is sending him back to Egypt. Uh, so, you think about Moses as, as a man here. His head must be spinning, right? What is going on with all of this? And so, in response to this message that the Lord gives him, what happens? Moses asks God two questions. The first question we considered at the end of last week in verse 11, who am I, right? Who am I that I should go back to Egypt and give this message to Pharaoh? And then, after that, verse 13, essentially, who are you? 
right? From who am, who am I to who are you? Verse 13, when I come to the people of Israel and I say, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? So from who am I to who are you? What is your name? I said it a couple of weeks ago, but it bears repeating here, right, that uh, names are very important. Uh, you, know, you know, to know somebody's name is what? To know something of their identity. It's why when you meet somebody new, what's the first thing you want to know? You want to know their name, right? Who are you? Uh, th you know, and think about it. Uh, you know, all you need is somebody's name. You type that name into a search engine uh, in our day, and you can find all sorts of things out about this person just by typing their name, right? What, where they grew up, what their address is, uh, all these sorts of things. We are rightly concerned in such a, such a context about protecting our name. Why? Because people can easily steal your identity if all they have is your name and a few numbers to go along with it. Uh, when you hear the name John Bonomo, you don't think just of the, the sound of the syllables you're hearing. For those of you who know me, you think rather about this, this magnificent display of humanity that you get to see before you every Sunday. Uh, you know, our name is, our, is, it captures our identity. Names are deeply important. It's important for us, especially so in the ancient world, especially so uh, in the biblical world. And so Moses, when he asks the Lord his name here, you need, to, you need to see, right, he isn't just asking for the proper pronunciation of the right syllables to, to say the name of God. What he's asking is the identity of this God. Why would he want to know the identity of this God? Well, because there were lots of gods in the ancient Near Eastern world, right? Egypt had lots of gods, and they had lots of different names. And to be sure, no doubt the people of Israel, they knew something of their history. They knew that their God was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they also know about all sorts of other gods who have all sorts of other names. Uh, and, so, and, and so while they knew something of who their God was, and keep in mind, right, that this, you know, F, this is all happening a few hundred years after all that stuff uh, in Genesis. This is happening a few hundred years after God had last spoken to Jacob. And so they didn't have Bibles that they were carrying around with them to read. Uh, but, and so they, they knew something of their God, but they, there, there was a lot that needed to be filled in. And so Moses wants to know, let, could you be specific about who exactly you are? What is your name? What do I tell them? What name do I t attach to the God who is sending me back to my people to distinguish you from all the other gods that we've heard about? Uh, so it's not odd here for Moses to ask this question. And you know, I can sort of, I can sort of relate to Moses in, this, in these first two questions that he asked the Lord, right? Who am I? And who are you? Uh, because this is, this is sort of the way that my journey to faith looked. Uh, these are really the ultimate two questions for all of us. Who am I and who is God? Right? Who am I and who is God? When I, I became a Christian, I was around 20 years old. Some of you know the story. I struggled a lot with questions like, who am I? Uh, what is my purpose? What is the meaning of, of my life? Why am I here, right? And ultimately, I became severely depressed because I thought that my life was meaningless and that I was worthless. And so depression, despair, and that sense of, of meaninglessness, right, drove me to a life of drug addiction, and to all sorts of other things in, in attempts to fill up that sense, of, that, that sense of emptiness that I had within me. Uh, and guess what? It, didn't, it just made me feel more and more empty. And it was in that context of my own emptiness, not knowing who I was, that God came in the gospel of His Son, Jesus Christ, and spoke into that emptiness of my heart and said, John, you're looking in all the wrong places. The, the answer to the question, who are you, is not found within you. It's found only in me, the God who made you. And so maybe today for you, you're somebody who's here and you're wondering, what is life all about? Who am I? Why am I here? It seems purposeless. 
I want you to know that God has offered himself to you in the gospel of Jesus, his only son. And he says, find the meaning of all of these things in me. Because it is only when we see the answer to the second question, who is God, that we find the answer to the first question, who am I? I only know myself rightly in relationship to the God who made me. And so notice here, God doesn't rebuke Moses for asking his name, but he answers him. Verse 14, he, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am who I am. The Hebrew is ehyeh asher ehyeh. Not sure for you Hebrew experts if I'm pronouncing that properly, but that's what it is. Ehyeh asher ehyeh. Three words in Hebrew. It's worth pointing out. There are all sorts of ways that we could translate this. Uh, it, it, you may have some footnotes in your Bible. Um, it could be, uh, I, I am who I am, I am what I am, I am that I am. It could be, I will be what I will be, that I will be, wh who I will be. And all of those are sort of appropriate. Why? Because none of those in itself captures everything that this God that we're talking about really is. He is the God who was and is and is to come. He has been what he has been. He is what he is and he will be what he will be. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. Uh, and, he is the, and he is the God who comes to us. He goes on, verse 15, he says, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of J Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So you may have noticed the shift there from I am to the Lord. It's worth noting that when you see the Lord, the word the Lord in your English Bibles, and it's in all capital letters, that is the, that is the name of God. That is Yahweh, right? And both Ehyeh from the previous verse and Yahweh come from the Hebrew come from the same Hebrew verb, hayah, which means to be. And so these aren't two different names. These are actually two synonymous names for the same God. Uh, and so it's just important to keep in mind. I am, God is saying, the same God who has been God from before the creation of the world. From the time of the patriarchs, I am the God who has been with you from the time of Abraham. And he says, from generation to generation and forever, I am who I am into the ages for all eternity. I am world without end. Amen. Amen. Uh, before the beginning, God is. Without anything else in all of creation, God is who He is. He is who He is without, without anything outside of Himself adding anything to Him. He is the fire in the bush, not consuming the bush because it is not dependent upon the bush for its existence. That is, that is a picture of God's relationship to the world. He is present in our world, but He is not dependent upon anything in our world to add anything to Him, to His existence, to who He is. He is who He is. That is the true and living God. Uh, St. Augustine, reflecting on this God in his great book, The Confessions, uh, which is written as a prayer about his life to God, he says this, he's talking to the Lord and he says, What then are you, O Lord my God? What I ask but the Lord God, for who is the Lord but the Lord? Or who is God save our God, most high, most excellent, most potent, most omnipotent, most merciful and most just, most hidden and most near? most beautiful and most strong, abiding yet mysterious, unchangeable yet changing all things, never new, never old, making all things new, always working yet ever at rest, always gathering yet needing nothing, sustaining, pervading and protecting, creating, nourishing and perfecting, seeking and yet possessing all things. You recover what you find, having yet never lost. You are never in want, though you rejoice and gain. You pay debts, though you owe nothing. And when you forgive debts, you, you lose nothing thereby. You are my God, my life, my holy delight. Yet... Augustine concludes, What is all of this that I have said? For what can anyone adequately say 
when he's talking about you. This is God. Words fail. Our words, our thoughts cannot begin to even scratch the, the smallest sliver of, a, of the surface of who this great, awesome, majestic, mysterious, whole, infinitely holy God is. And yet, we must find words. We must find words. He tells us to go and speak of Him. And so, so that you might have words to speak about this God, what has happened? What has God done? The Word Himself became flesh and dwelt among us. It is so that you might have things, real, true, tangible things to, uh, to say about this God, to put, put flesh onto this God. That God Himself took our flesh upon Himself and walked around in our skin and spoke in our words and with our voice. Do you want to know what this God is like? You need look no further than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the full revelation of the Father's character and the Father's love to you, beloved. Acts chapter 17, when the Apostle Paul is in Athens, this really interesting scene where he comes across this altar uh, that is, that is uh, d dedicated to an unknown God. It's dedicated to the unknown God. And Paul points to that inscription as he's talking to the people there in the city of Athens, all these philosophers and, and things. And he says to these people of Athens, what therefore you worship as unknown to the unknown God, I proclaim to you. And he goes on to make this point that this unknown God God is actually a God who is not far from any of us, though He is invisible. Verse 28, Paul says in Acts 17, in Him we live and we move and we have our being. Beloved, this is the unknown God whom all of us know exists. Deep down inside, each and every one of us, even people who deny His existence, what is going on? They're using the very reasoning faculties that this God has given them to deny His existence. And so testifying in their very denial of Him that He exists, because where does that reasoning come from? Where, does, where do the laws of logic come from? They only come from this God who has made us in His image. You see, we all have, beloved, this innate desire to know this unknown God. It's why when we don't know Him, we feel so empty, because the problem is, Left to ourselves, we cannot attain to Him. There's no ladder that you can climb to yourself get up to heaven. We are all like the people of Israel in Egypt. We are enslaved in a world of sin and misery. And as people who are enslaved by, by in this world of sin and misery, we can't break those chains ourselves. We need somebody else to break those chains for us. And that is exactly what God has done in Jesus Christ. He has come down to us and He has broken the chains and He has lifted up our eyes to His throne in heaven. And this is the promise of the gospel that this God of Exodus, that this God of the way out, that this God who is, is the living God. He has seen, He has heard, He knows, and He has come down as He says in Exodus 3, 7. And, and He has done it in, in Exodus with the people of Israel, and He has done it for all of humanity in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And not just in myths and stories like the ancient gods, and not just in brilliant philosophical systems or political theories like all of the supposed deliverers of our day, but He has come and He has done it in reality. He has done it in human history. He has broken the chains and He has brought eternal life. Amen? He is the I Am in our flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so notice when God tells Moses here, I am who I am, He doesn't just leave it at that, does He? He fills in what that means for the people that He's sending Moses to to assure them all of His promise of salvation. Look at verses 16 through 18. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I 
promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. You see what's going on here. God is promising not only that He is going to bring them out, but also that He is going to bring them to. And this is the gospel, beloved. Jesus Christ is for us not only the way of out of sin and death, He is the way to freedom and life and peace, and joy, and all of the good things of His kingdom. He is, he is the God of the way out who comes to us to break our chains. And this, and, and this is the God that we serve, and this is the God who has taken on flesh in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus, we hear not only write, I am who I am, but we hear, I am the bread of life. Are you hungry? Come to me and eat. I am the light of the world. Do you doubt? Come to me and have light. I am the good shepherd. Are you lost? Are you wandering? Have you gone astray? Come to me and let me lead you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Come to me and live. I am who I am, and I have come to be who I am for you. For you. That is the gospel. Amen. But here's the thing, as we go on, we find that there's even more, right? This message of Exodus has two sides to it. Uh, it has the message of salvation, yes. It also has the message of judgment. The message of judgment. Be why? Because the Lord knows that this is a Pharaoh who, who is not going to bend. This is a Pharaoh who is bent on his own power. And just as God has come down to save the people of Israel, so he has come down to bring judgment upon Pharaoh and his kingdom. Look at verses 19 and 20. The Lord says, but I know, verses 19 and 20, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless, unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the land of Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. Both salvation and judgment. You see, beloved, in a world that is in captivity to sin and death and evil and the powers of darkness, there can be no such thing as salvation without judgment. It cannot be. The evil and the sin of the world, the evil and the sin of my heart even, needs to be judged in order for me to be saved. And we often think about judgment as a bad thing, but I want you to understand it is a supremely good thing. You think about all of the, all of the evil and injustice and atrocities that happen in our world, there is coming a day of reckoning. That's good news, beloved. It's, it's hard to think about, but it's good news. I remember Women in the Word uh, last year, right, had the theme, the good news of, of judgment, right? Judgment is part of the gospel. And even part, even an essential part of your own personal salvation. Because what has happened in the cross of Jesus? What has happened so that God can save you? Right? Even the evil in me needs to be judged in order for me to be saved. This is the message of the cross. There is no salvation without judgment upon sin. It's why Paul says what? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You see, your sins were judged on the cross with Jesus. And then, wonder of wonders, they were buried in the grave if you are found in Christ, never to rise again. Like Pharaoh's army buried in the very same sea of judgment that God's own people were brought across as on dry ground and saved. Our sins were buried in the cross of Jesus Christ. It was by judging our sins that God made a public spectacle of all of His and our enemies in the cross. And it is through that judgment and Christ's vindication and victory through that judgment in His resurrection that you and I are now saved. This is the unchanging message of the unchanging God for the world. He comes to bring salvation. 
And he comes to bring judgment. And we all, every single one of us, have but two options. Either place my sins on the cross with Jesus through faith to be judged in his death and I be clothed with his righteous life or keep them for myself for the judgment on the last day and take my chances with this holy God who is a consuming fire. And I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but on that day, I want to do everything that I possibly can to be found not alone, but in Christ. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen? Amen. But wait, there's more. <laughs> there's still more. Uh, you see, if you place your sins upon Christ, what happens? God gives you hope not only for the life to come, but also for this life. Check this out. Verses 21 and 22 as the chapter concludes. I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Astounding. And when you go, you shall not go empty. I'm going to provide for your needs for the journey. Uh, but each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing, you shall put them on your sons and your daughters, so shall you plunder the Egyptians. Just astounding. It's promised here. It actually happens in chapter 12. Uh, chapter 12, verses 35 and 36, the Lord gives them favor with the very people of Egypt so that what happens? The very wealth of Egypt is taken up in service to the Lord and His purposes. God provides for their needs for the journey. And you can be sure that in your life, He will provide for your needs for your journey as you sojourn in this world. We are so anxious and worried about so many things. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us, Luke chapter 12, right? Uh, why are you so worried? God, care, your Father in heaven cares for the birds, and you are of so much value than the birds. Oh, you of little faith. So, let me uh, move toward closing by revisiting the question that we are revisiting throughout this series on Exodus. Are you stuck or are you sojourning? Are you stuck or are you sojourning? Beloved, only as we stand on this rock of our God, the great I am, only as we stand on the, on the rock of the never-changing God can we have hope and assurance and peace as we sojourn through this ever-changing world. Moses lived in, in a turbulent world. He lived a life that went through some huge, huge changes, but his God was this never-changing God. I am who I am, and his purposes were always good for Moses and for all of his people, no matter what they saw happening in front of them. You and I, too, don't we? We also live in a very turbulent world, a world that's ever-changing. Our lives go through so many changes, but our God is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is the only reality in your life that will never, ever, ever, ever change. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. He was and is and is to come. And in, in the church, right, there are so many joys and sorrows so many ups and downs, new life coming into the world, as we're hoping to see later on today with my son. Uh, other lives departing the world. Uh, so many ups and downs, baptisms and burials. Uh, people coming to faith and walking away from the faith. Some gaining victory over sin, others falling into sin. Uh, my third child about to be born into this ever-changing world. And there's lots of fear and anxiety that can go along with raising children in this world, isn't there? Uh, particularly as things in our society change so fast all around us, right? Outrage 
spreading overnight because of social media, all sorts of movements springing up. It seems like every single day there's a new movement, a new cause to get behind, uh, you know, technology that I can't possibly hope to keep up with, ever-growing fear of economic collapse, uh, you know, mass destruction, all of these things, right? What is my hope for me and my family? What is my hope for my children and my grandchildren? What is my hope for this, our church, and for all of the churches in this community, and for the church around the world, in in, in the presence of such a world and such an uncertain life? It is that even as we have been born into this ever-changing world, so through the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been born again into union with the never-changing God. And we have in Him an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you as that God is keeping you through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. Psalm 18, verses 30 and 31. And I will leave you with this. Psalm 18, 30 and 31. The Lord has been filling my soul with this uh, throughout this week. It says, This God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all who take refuge in Him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? There is no other. And when all around my soul gives way, what? He then is all my hope and, and stay. This is my prayer, beloved, for myself. This is my, my prayer for my son who is about to be born. This is my prayer for the rest of my family. And this is my prayer for all of you here today that in knowing this God, the God who is the I am that I am, you might know yourself and that you might see everything about yourself and about your life and about the world around you in relation to Jesus Christ, the rock, who is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you have promised and you have revealed yourself to us for who you are. And so I pray today... For, for we who are weak in faith, for we who are so prone to be unstable, for we who are so prone to wander, for we who are tossed to and fro by the winds and the waves and the sea of life, be our rock, O Lord, our fortress, our strength, our deliverer. Help us, O Lord, to see in you the one who will never leave us or forsake us and to testify to who you are with the words that you would give us by your Spirit in this world. We pray all of these things in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.